Guten Abend und herzlich willkommen im Literaturhaus Berlin. Als Isabel Graf das letzte Mal bei uns im Literaturhaus war und ihre Ausgabe von Texte zur Kunst über die Autofiktion vorstellte, da war der Saal hier gerappelt voll. Heute wird das anders sein. Dafür ermöglicht uns das Digitale, dass wir Chris Kraus aus den USA zuschalten können. Und die beiden Autorinnen unterhalten sich über das neue Buch von Isabel Graf in einer anderen Welt. Ich wünsche Ihnen und uns allen viel Spaß. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Guten, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Thank you, Frau Longolius, for having invited us and for having made this online reading event possible. And thank you also very much, Chris, for having this discussion with me about my book. My book is called In Another World, in German, In Einer Anderen Welt, Notes 2014 to 2017. Here it is. And um, I'm going to start with a short reading of one of the texts in that book. And uh, this will be followed by a discussion between us. And in between the discussion, I will read some more. That sounds good. Great, looking forward. It will be in German, my reading, so bear with me. Okay. <laughs> 121 Souvenir. Gestern Morgen ist etwas Eigentümliches passiert. Ich wachte, wie immer, viel zu früh auf und wurde von quälenden Gedanken heimgesucht. Einmal mehr ging es um den plötzlichen Tod meiner Mutter. Für mich ist es unerträglich, kein Zeichen von ihr zu bekommen und ich begann, mich bei einem imaginären Gegenüber heftig darüber zu beschweren. Unzumutbar sei eine solche Situation, wo der dringende Wunsch nach Kontakt nicht gehört würde, wo meine Mutter unerreichbar für mich bleibe. Ich steigerte mich in diese Empörung hinein und nahm schließlich ein Buch zur Hand, um mich zu beruhigen. Lektüre hilft mir in aufgewühlt, untröstlichen Zeiten eigentlich immer. Es war die Geschichte meines Lebens, von Georges Sand, ein Buch, das ich aus dem Nachlass meiner Mutter mitgenommen und auf meinem Nachttisch platziert hatte. Ich schlug das Buch auf und eine Postkarte fiel heraus, die ich im Jahre 1992 aus England an meine Mutter geschrieben hatte. Es war eine Kunstpostkarte mit einem Bild von Fragonard mit dem Titel »The Souvenir« aus der Wallace Collection, das eine Frau in glänzender Robe dabei zeigt, wie sie einen Buchstaben, wohl den Anfangsbuchstaben des Namen ihren, ihres Liebhabers, an einen Baum schreibt. Einziger Zuschauer dieser Szene ist ein Hund, was mich dazu veranlasst haben muss, dieses Bild für meine Mutter feministisch zu interpretieren. In meinem kurzen Text auf der Postkarte drückte ich zunächst einmal meine Hoffnung darauf aus, dass ihr dieses Bild gefallen würde. Dann deutete ich es als Allegorie einer Situation, in der weibliche Schriftsteller nicht auf ein Publikum hoffen dürfen, denn von ihren literarischen Arbeiten wurde im 18. Jahrhundert kaum Notiz genommen. Deshalb sei es in diesem Bild von Fragonard allein der Hund, der die Rolle des Publikums für einen weiblichen Produzenten spielte. Dass mir diese Karte, eine Kommunikation mit meiner Mutter, ausgerechnet in dem Moment in die Hände fiel, als ich verzweifelt nach einem Zeichen von ihr verlangte, lässt mich an höhere Mächte glauben. Irgendeine Instanz wollte mich mit der herausfallenden Postkarte wohl trösten. Meine Mutter hatte sie ausgerechnet in ein Buch von Georges Sand gesteckt, das sie zum damaligen Zeitpunkt wahrscheinlich las. Jetzt frage ich mich, ob ich auf ein ähnliches Zeichen von meinem Vater hoffen darf. Okay. That's it. Uh, yeah. First reading. 
<laughs> I hope it's you about, kind of followed. <laughs> yeah, I follow. I followed in the English version. Um, I remember when we talked. Um, the first thing you told me about your book was that you hadn't set out necessarily to write a book. You hadn't planned this as a book. Rather, you began at a certain point, I think in the aftermath of your parents' death, to make these notes. And I, I wanted to ask you more about that, you know, more about what the process was. Um, first, I'm not clear. Um, was it your mother who, who died first and then your father? It was my, it actually was my father who died first. He died in um, December 2013. And I started writing the book in the beginning of 2014, on January 1st, actually. And it was not intended to be a book of mourning. I just, you know, realized that something extreme was happening to me, that I was losing my usual horizon. And I also realized that there were so many things happening in my life that I wasn't able to analyze in the way I wanted to, because I always worked on texts about art. So I felt that I, I, I felt that I needed a form where all my thoughts that didn't end up in my art critical or art historical writing could be made productive. And I opted for, you know, every morning, just after having gotten up, I decided, you know, I will write a little aperçu, I called it in French, a kind of miniature, just as a warm up, and then I get to my real work. But then after a while, I realized that this warm up was becoming the real work, or that it was becoming more and more important. I started to rewrite the texts, to edit them, to think about them. Every time something happened to me, either in the street or in the gym or, you know, in a waxing studio even, I kind of gathered my thoughts and wrote them down. So, so I was surprised myself that this ended up being a book. It was not meant to be. It's, it's funny, Isabel, as, as you describe that, I thought of two other, um, two other books by two other writers that were composed in exactly the same way and under the same circumstances. I don't know, are you familiar with the work of the American writer Harry Matthews? No. Who died a few years ago? He was a, um, a great experimental prose writer. Yes. And after the loss of a close friend of his, he found he didn't want to work on anything else. Um, so he set himself the task, he called it 10 lines a day, and he decided that no matter what, he was going to write these 10 lines a day. And that eventually became the book, and it's a wonderful book called 10 Lines a Day. I'll check it um, out. <laughs> also, um, a friend of mine and a colleague in LA, Matthias Wegener, he wrote a terrific book called 2500 Things About Me, also in the form of a kind of list poem. And this was also in the aftermath of the death of his friend, his mother, and his dog, the Dalmatian Peggy. And um, it was a book that he procrastinated writing, but somehow the combination of the form and those three deaths gave everything a frame and a shape. So it sounds as if you were very disciplined about this. Once you began, you decided yeah. you were gonna do it every day. Yes, I, I, I tend to be disciplined, but, but I think my models where on the one hand, someone like Annie Arnaud was a great influence because in a way, in her books, she manages to write a cultural biography. You know, her autobiographical kind of notes yes. are always combined with more like sociological insights. So that was one idea. I really wanted this I that I was using to be social through and through. And I really wanted to combine a kind of very personal approach with a cultural critical approach, so to speak. And my other model was maybe 
Adornos Minima Moralia, <laughs> to, to have a, you know, to, to, to be not very modest. And also, you know, I've recently read Roland Barthes' preparation for a novel. And that's also a very interesting text because he started writing this just because, <laughs> just after his mother died. And he realized, you know, he was like asking himself, am I going to write academic texts for the rest of my life? Or am I using this crisis moment for, a, he calls it Vita Nueva, for a new life where I might even write a novel? Of course, he has never written the novel, but the preparations for a novel are an interesting book. I mean, at times also a bit tedious and uh, manieristic as always in Barth, but, but also very interesting as a project. Yes, it's funny the way the novel is, you know, elevated above all else. I mean, yes. in, in Barth's work, obviously, you know, the great dream and desire and aspiration to write a novel that never quite happens, but all the work of not writing the novel becomes the work, you yes. know, and probably much more interesting than the novel ever would have been. Exactly. Um, I actually, I thought of Walter Benjamin when I read your book. I've yeah. been rereading a lot of Benjamin lately, especially One Way Street, mm -hmm. a book that I love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the little entries and the way that Benjamin ranges from something that is just, you know, blindingly intimate to something that is sociographic and completely political. He has that, that beautiful fluency. Um, it has to do, I think, you know, it, it's not, it's not something that one can impose. It, it has more to do with how you see the world. And so I think it's very wonderful that you began this project because your years of work and training as a critical theorist inform everything that you say and see about the minutiae of daily life, you know, which comes into the book in such a great way. You know, from um, the nail polish, I guess that was something that really, for whatever reason, that's very memorable. The, the what? You do a kind of, a, the nail polish, the nail salon. Oh, the nail salon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. You do a kind of art critical reading. You've already been talking, you know, about luxury goods in general, kind of how the idea of luxury is constructed and what the desire is behind, you know, the appeal of luxury. And then you talk about that kind of the poster of, of the glossy nail polish on the finger <laughs> and the, the haptic qualities of that. <laughs> Anyway, it's it's absolutely brilliant. And so I think it becomes in you know it's funny that you mention Annie or no, because um to me I, I thinking about her book The Years, that was a very conscious effort of universalizing one's experience. I mean, and she does that in her use of the pronoun. Mm -hmm. She never says I, the I becomes a we. She's speaking for a whole generation. Um, but you're speaking, your eye becomes an eye of, you know, consumer experience as well. Yes. My eye comes an eye that is, if you want, kind of claims also for something that could be more of a universal kind of uh, nature, nature that is more general than what happens to me, but then also what happens to me is also filtered very much by the universal at the same time. And you know, when I write about nail polish or the glossy nail polish as an example for what Marx called the fetish, because the fetish, according to Marx, hides its conditions of production and the nail polish also hides the actual condition of the nail underneath. So I thought there was... <laughs> I know, that's very funny. <laughs> there, 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 was, there was, a, was a kind of interesting parallel here. And also, you know, with Annie Arnaud, I, I thought that using the we and using the she, you know, that, that was a bit kind of artificial. In a way, I prefer, I prefer when one is able to say I and with and when, when this I at the same time transcends the kind of ego and uh, allows for identification in a much more in a much wider sense of the term 
And to just come back to something else that you said, I think for me it was also very important to talk about a very specific time frame, 2014 to 2017. This is a time of shifts, of radical political shifts, of a shift to the right in many, many countries. It's the time where Brexit occurred, where Trump was elected, but it's also the time of me, the Me Too movement. So in a way, I also wanted all these you know, political changes that do affect the personal, evidently, especially if you happen to be marked as a woman in this society, I wanted that to enter the book as well. And, and maybe yeah. it's time for a little reading? Yes, yes. Okay, so because since we were speaking of nails, I might as well read a text which is called CrossFit Bootcamp, which is so <laughs> far away from the nail salon. <laughs> 93 CrossFit Bootcamp. Ein neuer Fitnesstrainer erscheint und kündigt an, dass heute eine Art Zirkeltraining auf dem Programm steht. Beiläufig lässt er Wörter der neuen Fitnessideologie wie CrossFit oder das extrem militaristisch klingelnde Bootcamp fallen. Er hat Stationen aufgebaut, die von allen Teilnehmerinnen durchlaufen werden sollen. Gewichte heben, Liegestütze machen oder aus der Hocke weit nach vorne springen. Bevor es losgeht, brummt er uns ein Warm-up wie vom Gefängnishof auf. Alle rennen stumpf im Kreis, während er wie ein Offizier aufgrund der lauten Musik schwer verständliche Kommandos brüllt. Bei eins soll hochgesprungen, bei zwei sollen Liegestütze mit abschließendem Hochsprung gemacht und bei drei abrupt die Laufrichtung gewechselt werden. Wir mutieren zu einer Mischung aus braven Soldaten und sanften Lämmern, die sich von ihm ihre Bewegungen diktieren lassen. Die Musik könnte man als polligen Mainstream-Techno charakterisieren, während die geschrienen Kommandos an militärischen Drill erinnern. Ging es in früheren Fitnessformaten noch darum, die Kursteilnehmerinnen sanft zu korrigieren, macht dieser Trainer selbst mit und hält sich seinerseits fit, als wolle er uns zeigen, dass man jede Gelegenheit ergreifen müsse, um an seinem Körper zu arbeiten. Wer eines seiner Kommandos falsch ausgeführt hat, muss zur Strafe in die Mitte des Kreises und dort extra Liegestütze machen. Auch dieses Bestrafungsritual mit seiner Reminiszenz an die schwarze Pädagogik war lange Zeit aus den Sportkursen verbannt. Wie lässt sich die Rückkehr des guten alten Zirkeltrainings noch dazu in dieser autoritär-militaristischen Variante erklären? Warum hat Crossfit derzeit so viel Zulauf? Wohlmöglich entspricht dieses harte Training den als härter empfundenen Zeiten mehr als der Achtsamkeitskult des Yoga. Angesichts von unerbittlichem Konkurrenzkampf und mangelnder Solidarität in der Gesellschaft ist der hier in Aussicht gestellte starke und muskulöse Körper wieder gefragt. Resultat dieses Trainings soll schließlich ein gestählter, jederzeit sprungbereiter Körper sein, den nichts aus der Bahn wirft. Dass es heute wieder Menschen gibt, die sich freiwillig einem brüllenden Offizierstrainer unterwerfen, ist ebenfalls erklärungsbedürftig. Ich konnte mich zu einer weiteren Teilnahme an diesem Kurs jedenfalls nicht durchringen. Drückt sich in der Popularität des Bootcamp-Formats die Sehnsucht nach eindeutigen Kommandos in einer Zeit aus, in der im Arbeitsleben eher das Gegenteil, also Eigeninitiative, Selbstbestimmung und Teamwork verlangt werden? Der brüllende Trainer, der einen das Umkehren befiehlt, könnte aus dieser Perspektive eine entlastende Funktion haben. Nicht wir müssen einmal mehr Entscheidungen treffen, sondern er trifft sie für uns. Mit seiner Hilfe werden unsere Körper auf eine Weise trainiert, die uns das Leben in den derzeitigen ökonomischen Verhältnissen scheinbar erleichtert. Yeah. That was that? <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was great. Um, 2014 to 2017, those years contain not just a shift to the political right, but definitely a change in the quality of life in hypercapitalism. Um, 
I'm thinking especially of, you know, what you mentioned in this piece, you know, the rise of co-working spaces, the ethos of the team, the apparent submersion of the individual to the team effort, all of these, you know, all of these tentacles of soft capitalism as hypercapitalism moves ever more deeply inside us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this to me really is what your book is about. It's extraordinary, although it's written definitely in the wake of grief. And it is suffused with grief, and you're extremely frank, and um, completely, um, completely open about your own psychic and mental state. It's often such an analysis systemically of how we live. So let me read the question that I actually wrote down. So, um, yeah. I think a lot more about Walter, Walter Benjamin than I do about Maggie Nelson reading your book. The mm -hmm. entries in another world Thanks. remind me of One Way Street and also of Moscow Diary a bit. The way your interests range, uh, sometimes they're intensely personal and very honest, but they always return to an observation of systems and how the system works. From German reality TV, to the disingenuousness of separating an artwork from the commercial system, to the seating plans used at a post-opening dinner. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's not really a question, I guess. I could frame it as a question. Um, obviously, in your art critical work, that's something that characterizes your art critical work, is the analysis of how a system works. Were you, I mean, were you very conscious in the way that you were bringing that focus into these aspects of daily life, like the nail salon, the CrossFit class? I mean, another section of the book, I don't think you're going to read it today, but it really stood out to me. You're addressing something about the refugee crisis, the Syrian refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, an incident that happens in your own daily life. This is another parent. Um, who you meet at your daughter's primary school or daycare. He's a Syrian former accountant who's unable to work as an accountant because of the credentialing system in Germany. And so he has to do another kind of work, probably a very menial work that he's not accustomed to. And you want to help. And other people, other parents in the school want to help too. But at the same time, you're so enmeshed in your own system of obligations and busyness that there are limits as to how much you can give yourself to this help. So you see yourself also very much caught in the web of this system of professional kind of bourgeois life in Germany at that moment. Absolutely. So can you talk about systems and how you're aware of them and how you analyze them? Yeah. I I would like to first um, say something, something about grief, uh, since you mentioned it, because grief indeed is the red thread that runs through the book. And, uh, you know, because I, I was interested in capturing this other world we find ourselves in once our parents have died. It's, it's literally a different world where, where we, le we kind of lose our orientation and a whole set of givens. So I was interested in that, but I was also interested of, and you hinted to that, I was interested in, in kind of finding out how what Foucault called technologies of power or biopower, a power that targets as our effects, that targets our subjectivities how that works exactly. So I'm not only interested in finding out, you know, how the CrossFit boot camp forms <laughs> certain subjectivities, but I'm also interested in finding out what is attractive about it. Why do people do this? Why do they even want to be treated this way? You know, why does it succeed to actually speak to our current needs and what are they? So. So this is what I'm interested in. And, you know, the, the task basically was, I think in each text in a way, I wanted to, to kind of link the personal to the systemic and the structural. Meaning that every time something happens to me, like on a kind of more 
personal level, I'm thinking about its systemic and structural dimension. I'm trying to, to, to link the two in order to realize, in, in order to demonstrate that our problems are not individual problems. They are specific, but they are also always structural. They are social to a certain degree. And, and I was interested in, in finding this out in a less abstract way as I'm talking about this now. Yeah, I think that's extraordinary. I'm crossing over into this other country of Greece, as you say, and that's such a great title. Um, I, I mean, I imagine you become, you're living in a different emotional pitch and you become hyper aware of your own subjectivity. And what's extraordinary to me is that it doesn't stop there. I mean, as I think an American book probably would, or most American books would, um, it would it would be a very deep and thorough examination of your feelings as if your feelings exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. But luckily, you have this whole other life as a critical theorist that you very consciously bring in and it makes your book so singular because it, it, it's both such a kind of, you know, emotionally immediate and psychologically true depiction of, you know, daily life, living in the shadow, lived in the shadow of grief. But at the same time, as you say, you're doing this intense work of figuring out how that is placed within a system. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as we were saying before we started recording, I think, you know, before when we were talking about how to do this conversation, we were going on and on about memoir, autofiction. Yeah. But it's not really that at all. It's a very deep analysis of capitalism and how capitalism moves inside us, how hypercapitalism has moved inside. And I, you know, I can't think of another book that has done this in the way that you do. Yeah, for, for me, someone like, I don't know if you know Deborah Levy's work, uh, the, the British writer, her work is also grouped under the term autofiction. And, you know, she talked about the I that speaks in her work that is an I that is not her, but close to her, or kind of has a lot in common with her. I always liked that formula. And I think in her work, there is also high awareness of, the, of, of what society, or, or in what way society actually um, implicates on individual experiences and how we are not these kind of you know, isolated monads, but we are very much formed by social conditions and social constraints. And so I, th I think there are some, especially women writers who have been rubriced under the term autofiction, who have managed to, to look at, you know, at the way especially female writers as they are constantly confronted with being marked as female, how they have to deal with the social in a very specific way and with social constraints. But what I was also interested in, Chris, and I think you hinted to that, is to find a language for emotions, for strong emotions, emotions such as grief, that are not cliched and that have maybe also benefited, in my case, from therapy. For me, something like therapy is also a way to, to kind of think about one's emotions, first of all, via language, but also in a more, how can I say, analytic way, without yeah. diminishing their intensity. So that was also something I, I was interested in. I mean, I didn't want to write a book that contains confessions, but I wanted to not kind of shy away from from strong emotions uh, and and find a language that that would not be embarrassing so to speak i don't know if i succeeded but that was another thing i wanted to try and maybe yeah. it's time for reading what do you think 
Oh, yes. Shall I quickly do Go one ahead. because I have one with the motions and then we continue? Yes, please okay, do great. that. 18. Musik und Jenseits. Die Pastorin neulich hatte recht, als sie bemerkte, dass Chorsängerinnen und Musikerinnen ein stärker ausgeprägtes Empfinden für Jenseitiges hätten, sie wären aufgeschlossener für Wunder und dergleichen. Beim Hören von klassischer Musik habe ich diese Empfänglichkeit für Transzendentales auch an mir selbst beobachten können. Die Musik beim heutigen Konzert in der St. Matthäuskirche waren es zwei Trios von Johannes Brahms und Franz Schubert. Die Musik scheint eine direkte Verbindung zum Jenseits herzustellen. Ich spürte meinen verstorbenen Vater jedenfalls ganz deutlich und meinte, mit ihm in Kontakt zu treten. Ich war mir sicher, dass es ihm dort, wo er jetzt ist, gut geht. Die Sonne strahlte durch das Kirchenfenster, er schien irgendwo gut aufgehoben zu sein und sich von sämtlichen Strapazen seines von Traumata gepflasterten Lebens zu erholen. Es ist diese Offenheit für Überirdisches, die sich auch beim Singen einstellt, wo man ja ohnehin aus sich selbst heraus und in eine andere Sphäre eintritt. Singend überschreitet man sein Selbst und schwingt sich buchstäblich zu anderen Höhen auf. Vielleicht ist es seit meiner Kindheit die Vertrautheit mit dem Singen und der klassischen Musik, die mich für Erlebnisse, die nicht im Hier und Jetzt aufgehen, besonders empfänglich macht. Solche Erfahrungen einer gleichsam überirdischen Intensität können einem auch in der Liebe passieren, weshalb Musik und Liebe von einem reißfesten Band zusammengehalten werden. Das spürte ich heute im Konzert sehr deutlich, da mir die Musik plötzlich das Verlangen eingab, den Mann an meiner Seite zu berühren. Glücklicherweise schien er von einem ähnlichen Begehren erfüllt, denn auch er streckte seine Hand nach mir aus. So, this was emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I'd actually like to read your notes that you sent to me in an email about what we're supposed to be talking about after that reading. Okay. Because I think it's absolutely on point. Um, you say writing means reading. Writing and reading. Reading is an integral part of my, that is you, Isabel, and also your, me, Chris, writing. I'm thinking here of all the books by Simone Bay or Ulrike Meinhof that you mention, unquote, in Aliens and Anorexia, how to navigate between these two activities. Too much reading can be paralyzing, but writing without reading also seems to narrow down the scope of one's own writing. In, in another world, I opted for an experimental and more fragmented kind of writing. This means that life is not to be presented as an integral whole in the book. Rather, it shows it to be fragmented or episodic. And these fragments are furthermore often prompted by a private crisis or a transformation. In my case, the death of my parents, illoyal behavior of art world friends, experiences of sexual harassment, being separated from the father of my child, political shift to the right, etc. Do we need crisis in autofiction as material to be rendered productive? Is crisis needed because it allows others to identify with it, considering they might have gone through something similar in their lives? And this type of identification, and could this type of identification be more needed than ever, considered we living, we live in an economy of isolated beings who are expected only to pursue their own self-interest? And um, I say, yes, I totally agree. Um, I think that without the crisis, maybe there wouldn't be the book in a certain kind of writing. Mm -hmm. That's definitely true of my own writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I began writing my first novel, I Love Dick, was definitely written at a moment of crisis when I was backed into a corner and writing seemed to be the only means of escape from that corner. And um, as I began writing I Love Dick, I knew that it would be a trilogy, that it would take me three books 
to do what I had to do to deal with that crisis. And to me, it was a crisis, not obviously not just the, reject, the rejection of the nominal dick, <laughs> but it was a crisis of feeling, having been in the art world for 20 years, and yet having been virtually silenced by my, you know, marriage to someone more powerful, silent for various reasons, silent because of my own position as a working class person in an upper middle class culture, et cetera, et cetera. And I knew that it would take me three books to write my way out of this corner. So yes, it was a crisis on various levels. Um, but you know, but, but you know what I'm, I was just thinking, um, about crisis and apart from the cri the personal crisis in my life you know the death of my parents um, being separated from the father of my child and all kinds of you know personal disappointment when it comes to you know friends that don't behave as loyally as one would wish them to which also has a lot to do with the kind of competitive society with live in which we live in right now I think another crisis I had was a bit similar to what you are describing. I mean, I didn't feel silent, but I felt that I had spent like most of my life mediating the works of artists, you know, talking about the work of someone else and also realizing that in the art world, there was like since 10 years or so, there's a hierarchy being established, and this was not always the case, it was very different, for instance, in the 1920s, where writers and critics were supposed to be like on top, and they were supposed to be the authorities. But now, since we live in an art world that is so much dominated by market success and market criteria, you know, critics and his art historians are very low in the hierarchy. They are needed to produce meaning, but they are paid mostly not so well. And they are considered secondary to the artists, which are, you know, um, celebrated uh, like saints. And I, I felt un more and more uncomfortable, you know, kind of providing service in such a situation. <laughs> Can I can I just interject yes. something here? I have come to exactly the same point right now. As of maybe two or three months ago, I decided that I am refusing to write another art essay. Um, I'm asked to do that often, you know, um, and I, I, I just I, I just experienced this revulsion of it recently. Um, and I feel that whatever I say, it's exactly the same. There's something so formulaic. There's something so kind of preordained about whatever I might write. It seems complete. It seems completely useless. And um, so, I mean, many assignments I'm just turning down. A couple of them I've wanted to accept because I like the artist's work. Um, I'm doing something now with Fernando Laguna for the Drawing Center in New York, but I told them I cannot write an essay about Fernando's work. I can only do a conversation, just as we're doing this conversation now. And it's a conversation that is, you know, I think informed by a lot of preparation, but I also believe that whatever insight that I might bring to Fernando's work in an essay can equally be manifested in a dialogue and perhaps in a more interesting way at this point. Yeah, I, I, I would agree that, that the monograph as a format is problematic because it's by definition, it's supposed to be apologetic. By definition, it's not far away from a press release text. So, you know, right. I also prefer conversations in this case. And of course, I still very much enjoy my art theoretical work. And I'm currently writing a book on the value of art, but that's, you know, you know, that's not a service. That's really my ideas about a kind of value theory um, exemplified also in what I call value reflexes, reflect, reflective artistic practices. So that's different. But to be this service providing meaning production person who's considered as the poor relative uh, in the art world 
you know, needed but underpaid, I was kind of a little bit, you know, I, I, I wanted something else. But of course, and we have talked about this in a phone call, Chris, there is a risk when you have been labeled in a certain way as art critic and art theorist in my case, and then you decide to write more literary and to say I and to try something else, there is often also a reaction, you know, of, yeah, you have to, you have to be ready for rejection. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It's not often <laughs> something that is welcome if you, if you decide to leave the place you have been assigned to in order to make a different claim. So I, I was also, to be honest, a bit nervous with this book because on the one hand, it exposes me to a certain degree and it's also rather daring since it's kind of very different to what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes, and yet, and yet it's not. It's just, you know, an intelligence that you have worked your whole life to form that's being exercised in a different way. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think that's very powerful. And some of the books that I edit with Samia text actually have come through a similar process. We um, we actually published um, a book by the German, I would say, writer now, um, as opposed to artist, Annette Weiser. She's we published brilliant. her first novel, Mycelium, which may you may have read this last season, and. Um, so prior to now, Aneta, Aneta teaches, she's a professor of art, she's had a career as a gallery artist, she's occasionally written essays or criticism, but like, boom, this is a novel. And it turns out to be the perfect forum for her to manifest what she's thinking and working on now. So this kind of switching from form to forum, I mean, maybe it also comes of a crisis, you know? We, we come up against a wall and there's no other way to continue in the form that we've been pursuing. And yet there's this content that needs to be manifested. And so it finds its form in a way that makes it much more alive than pursuing a form that's become dead to you because it becomes so well-practiced and so professionalized. Yeah, inter interestingly enough, uh, I had one other literary model who I was reading a lot uh, while writing these aperçus, which is Francis Ponge. And Ponge, you know, opted for highly experimental formats right after the Second World War, uh, saying somewhere even that aperçus and confused notes are the only thing we can leave behind in such circumstances, which, is, which I quoted in the book. So someone, someone like Ponge was inspiring to me as well because he always you know also talked about the financial conditions of his writing he always uh, talked about you know what he had how he had been paid uh, when he wrote texts on artists he was given paintings he rendered all the, his conditions of production seemingly transparent of course you know his statements have to be taken with a grain of salt and of course it's highly stylized but I liked this uh, this attempt to to write something that is very fragmentary, very experimental, and also completely Marxist at the same time, since it's about rendering one's conditions of production transparent. So Ponge was another kind of guiding force yeah. in this project. That's funny. I thought of Ponge this morning when I woke up. We hadn't <laughs> talked about that before. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, and your book also it has for all of its you know analysis and all of its you know extreme kind of structural awareness, it has a very musical form. Yes, mu music, music is very very important to me as uh, becomes also very clear in the book I think. And for me, you know, writing is a bit like singing. I mean, for me, what counts most after having said what I'm trying to say, it has to sound good. The sentences, you know, have to have to kind of read well in sequence. Uh, there, there has to be a rhythm. I, I have all these kind of weird criteria which have more to do with music than, than with writing that, I'm, that I've always applied to my writing. I always read it aloud and if it doesn't sound good, I have to rewrite it. 
And the criteria here is possibly very subjective and arbitrary, and it's not so <laughs> um, not not so easy maybe to 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 kind of uh, construct a, a norm from this. But but it's important, and maybe it's time for my last reading um, on writing. Maybe it could be a good moment to do that now. Yes. Viertens, schreiben. Schreiben ist eine Frage des in den Text hineinkommens. Diese Situation zögere ich allerdings immer wieder hinaus. Ich schiebe den Moment regelmäßig vor mir her, in dem mich der Text einfängt, mich geradezu vor sich her treibt. Je tiefer ich mich nämlich in ihn hineinbegebe, desto mehr bestimmt er über mein Leben. Für die Textproduktion wäre es vor diesem Hintergrund ideal, wenn ich nach einer Phase des Schreibens ohne Pause in den nächsten Text hinübergleiten würde. Denn jeder Neubeginn nach einer Schreibunterbrechung ist mit dem Risiko behaftet, dass es dieses Mal nicht klappt, weil ich das Schreiben endgültig verlernt habe. Auch mein Körper wehrt sich gegen die mit dem Schreiben verbundenen körperlichen Anstrengungen. Er will anfangs häufig vom Schreibtisch aufspringen, so als wolle er sich gegen die aus der Haltung beim Schreiben resultierenden Schulter- und Nackenschmerzen wehren. Bevor ich losschreibe, erledige ich aus diesem Grund erst einmal alles andere. Ich mache Arzttermine, beantworte E-Mails, ordne Bücher. Dann kommt irgendwann der Punkt, an dem mir der Würgegriff der Deadline keine Wahl lässt. Ich muss anfangen. Aber auch dann noch dauert es ein wenig, bis es wirklich losgeht. Zunächst verzettele ich mich und schreibe in viele Richtungen an unterschiedlichen Stellen des Textes. Je länger der Text wird, desto unvermeidlicher wird er mich in Strukturprobleme stürzen, die ich nur lösen kann, wenn ich ihn fortwährend ausdrucke, handschriftlich redigiere und seine Abschnitte anders anordne. Besser wäre es natürlich, die Argumentation und den Aufbau des Textes vorab festzulegen, aber das fällt mir ungemein schwer, weil sich seine Pointen oft erst beim Schreiben ergeben. Schreiben ist offenkundig eine Qual und doch irgendwie lebensnotwendig für mich, weshalb ich wohl dranbleibe. Ich genieße dabei vor allem das Privileg, beinahe täglich in Ruhe an meinem Schreibtisch sitzen, lesen und nachdenken zu können. Das ist eine der letzten Freiheiten, wie Adorno irgendwo gesagt hat. Eine Freiheit, die es gegen alle Anstürme von außen zu verteidigen gilt. Ja. <lacht> Writing. So this, this is the part about the finishing of a book and the reception of a book and what we go through. Um, in the aftermath of a book. And it seems to me from your notes that, that we're quite different in this respect, that you question yourself when the book is finished. And uh, I don't, I don't. Really? I mean, I, no, when I finish the book, I think, well, that's the best that I can do at this time. That's very I mean, healthy. I always know when the book is finished, you know, sometimes it's not finished as soon as I want it to be. But I always know when it is finished, and when it's finished, it's like, mm, that's it. That's all I can do with it right now. And then I put it away, and I kind of turn my, I don't look back. I don't want to look back. Um, yeah. You know, I don't go back, you know, except for the, you know, inevitable book events that we have to do to promote our books. Um, I don't go back, and I don't look at my work again after it's finished. I just want to look forward. Um, but in terms of the reception, you know, the questions that you raise about, you know, negative reviews, whether to read the reviews or not, um, how crippling the reviews can be. For me, the problem, what's really damaging and destructive in the aftermath of a book's reception is the way that we as writers, and I think maybe this is a particularly female phenomenon, in order for the book to be received at all, we need to be perceived as personalities. Yeah. And so the reviews become reviews of us as personalities rather than as the book of the book per se. I mean, 
I, you know, bring it on. Whatever criticism specifically people want to make of a book that I've published, I'm really, really interested in that. That people seem unable to separate the personality of Chris Cross, the writer, that they have constructed, you know, or that various, you know, reviewers have constructed. And so it becomes a critique of the personality rather than of anything that's in the book. And this drives me crazy. This is a real kind of inhibitor of freedom. Yeah, I, I think it's a very old problem. I think women artists and women writers have been confronted with this tendency that there is curiosity not for their work, but for the person behind the product for the way she lives her life. I mean, this is something that writers like, you know, Catherine Mansfields and many, many others had to deal with and also visual artists had to deal with that. And it has, of course, to do with the fact that once you are marked as a woman, you know, first of all, there's always, especially in older days, surprise that you actually made this, that you were able to kind of you know, transcend your duty as a female of, you know, creating a family and so on, and instead opted for becoming this, this writer. So there's curiosity, like people want to find out how did she make it? How did she get there? So th there's <laughs> that, which is really, really tedious. And especially if you say I in the book, you know, despite the fact that we are all literal, literary critics at this point, and we all know that autofiction means that this I is not our authentic self, but literary stylized. There might be some, you know, residual authentic moments in our writing, but it's highly, it's a literal abstraction from us. It's not us. Exactly. But, <laughs> But nevertheless, it's it's taken uh, this way. And when you talk about your take on reception and mine and them them being different, I, I mean, I envy you in a way. For me, the most blissful time, and I write about this in the book, the most blissful time is the time before the book comes out. Be, 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 because I'm not really immersed yet in another project and I don't really know how this book will be received. So I really enjoy these months where I'm kind of, you know, in a limbo. And when it comes to, you know, being satisfied with one's writing or not, for me, I have unfortunately a tendency and this might have to do with my, my habits of a critic. I, f I tend to focus on problems. I'm interested in problems. And as soon as I've written a book or written a text, I see the problems. I see, uh -huh. the, I see the deficits. And, um, you know, I remember when, when In Another World was sent to me first, I looked at the book and I thought, this is it. There's always yeah. also this, this moment where well, there's a that for sure. disappointment. I can't, I have a hard time, let's put it this way, to be proud, to lean back and to celebrate my accomplishments. I've never been good at that. I, I guess it's a way also of telling myself, okay, the next book will be it. The next book will be better. And this, of course, then makes me work harder and immediately get into the next project instead of just like, calming down for a moment and being happy with what I did, which is just something that is, that I have to learn from you, I guess. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I mean, that's for sure. The energy that one puts into a book will never be returned through the reception of the book. I mean, if you expect a balance, it will never happen. It's never enough. Yeah. Anyway, this has been a wonderful conversation. Isabel. I agree. Are we at this I really end? appreciate it. Because I, I thought it was just a beautiful ending. I think we should leave it there. What do you think? I think we should leave it there too. Yeah, I Plus, think we, I we were just to coming to the computer and the battery is about to die. Okay. Okay, I'm back in. Um, yes, I could. But or I think or, or shall we leave it the way we had it? I think we should leave it because okay. we didn't, 
you know, we transcended that problem. We really did talk to each other. Yes, it was wonderful. I'm so yes, sorry that it's technical. You, you know, just... when I'm on the other end, when I'm chairing a book, and I do an event with another local writer, I wish she would talk about her work. I really want it to be a conversation, but people don't want to expose themselves in that way. They just prepare a list of questions and that's it. There's no dialogue. I know. And I feel like we really have been able to have a conversation. It was wonderful. I mean, I would have much preferred to sit beside you, of course. <laughs> and I think we... Well, we'll do that next summer when I'm in Berlin. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Isabel Graf and Chris Kraus, for this wonderful conversation. Wir gehen jetzt aus dem Digitalprogramm wieder hinaus in den Garten auf unsere Balkone, machen jetzt eine Sommerpause und freuen uns dann ganz doll, Sie im Literaturhaus wiederzusehen, online oder analog im großen Saal. Wir wünschen Ihnen einen schönen Sommer.